In this Q&A video, we're going to answer the question, what are the different types of detector on a fire alarm system and where should I install them? Now, just before we explain the answer to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of fire alarms. They can be viewed individually or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD and receive a certificate to prove you've completed the course. Now, we often incorrectly refer to this type of device from BG Electrical as a smoke alarm, and we'll even see it on pre-printed labels on consumer units. However, to call them that is a little misleading, as the alarm part of this device is only one function. The other function is the detection of what's causing the problem in the first place. So what exactly do these devices detect? Well, there's four different things that can be detected that may give evidence of a fire breaking out. These four things are smoke, heat, combustion gas or carbon monoxide and flame. Now in a domestic setting, which is what we've been mainly covering in this presentation, we usually use the first three of these as flame detection is a fairly specialized bit of kit that detects the infrared and or UV radiation given off from a quickly developing blazing flaming fire rather than a smoldering one. So going back to the first point on our list, we've got smoke detectors. These are broken down into two further subcategories, these being ionization and optical smokes. An ionization smoke has a small chamber with a circuit wired to it so that there is an electrode at either end. If this was just left to its own devices, no current would flow through it and the circuit would be open. However, this chamber is filled with radiation from a small amount of radioactive material, usually americium-241. This radiation ionizes or adds subatomic particles to the air in the chamber, which allows current to flow through it. If smoke from a fire enters this chamber, the ionization is reduced and the current finds it harder to flow. This lower flow of current is a signal to the detector that there is smoke in the chamber and the alarm is triggered. This type of detector is more responsive to the relative abundance of very small particles that a flaming fire will produce. However, a low smoldering, still very dangerous fire produces larger smoke particles and the ionization detector is much less responsive to these. Therefore, this type of detector is less responsive to this type of fire. Because of this, the ionization detector is far less common than it used to be, and indeed many manufacturers either no longer make one or have never produced one. These devices from BG Electrical only come in the other form of smoke detection, which is optical. So how do these work? Well again, inside the detector, there's a small chamber with a light source on one side of it. Sitting off to another side at an angle to the light source is a photocell. Under normal operating conditions, when there's no smoke entering the light chamber, the light hits the far side of the chamber, is absorbed, and the photocell isn't triggered. If, however, large particles of smoke from a smouldering fire, which is the most common type of domestic fire, enter the chamber, the light bounces off the smoke particles, hit the photocell, which is then activated and in turn triggers the alarm. This type of fire detection is eminently suitable for most spaces in a domestic setting, except for one key area of risk. It's very important to try and avoid triggering false alarms on a system for two main reasons. The first is that if an alarm is constantly going off when there is no fire, it may lead the occupant to disconnect the detector, meaning that there's no alert system in place should an actual fire occur. Also, it can lead to a situation where the person has heard the alarm so much when there is no fire, that in the event of a real blaze starting, the alarm is passed off as another false start and simply ignored. One way to avoid a false alarm is by using heat detectors in areas where a smoke detector could be incorrectly triggered. The classic area for this is in the kitchen. If you're incredibly fussy about how you eat your toast, like a close female relative of mine whose name rhymes with Mrs R, then it may be that you often end up slightly overdoing the toast, which can lead to smoke, which would trigger a smoke detector if one was installed in the kitchen. Therefore, if your fire detection system is of a category that would require a detector in the kitchen, then instead of a smoke detector, you would install a heat detector instead. Heat detectors for alarm systems are one of two types, these being fixed temperature and rate of rise. As the name would suggest, a fixed temperature detector will be triggered if the temperature at the detector goes above a certain level. This is generally 58 degrees C. This is achieved by means of a thermistor mounted in the detector. As the temperature of the thermistor changes, its resistance changes value, and once this resistance reaches a certain value, it will then trigger the electronic circuit and sound the alarm. A rate of rise detector works a little differently. It has two thermistors in the head. One of these measures the ambient temperature in the room and the second one monitors the radiant or convective heat. The alarm is triggered in this case when there is a certain difference in value between the two thermistors 
as this would indicate a specific difference in temperature, meaning that a fire had broken out in the kitchen. The final type of detector we'll consider in this video is a carbon monoxide detector. Now, there's a couple of really important points to consider with this type of device. The first is they fall into two different categories. Snags and Solutions Book 5, published by the NIC EIC, speaks of carbon monoxide warning detectors and carbon monoxide fire detectors. A carbon monoxide warning detector is used to detect carbon monoxide that's given off from fuels not being properly burnt in things like boilers, gas fires, and so on. This type of detector will comply with BSEN 50291 and the Practical Guide to Grade D Fire Alarm Systems published by DocStore makes the point that devices conforming to BSEN 50291 should not be used in a fire detection and fire alarm system conforming to BS 5839-6. The NIC Snags and Solutions book also states that carbon monoxide warning detectors, therefore, should not be connected to a fire detection and fire alarm system. So this device from BG Electrical that complies with BSEN 50291-1 is classed as a carbon monoxide warning detector and could be used to detect CO from a faulty fuel burning appliance. It is physically able to be connected to a fire detection system consisting of smoke and heat detectors, but to properly comply with BS 5389-6, you shouldn't do that. The reason for this is how the occupier is supposed to respond to the alarm. If the CO detector is triggered, it would sound all the alarms in the property, and it would be difficult for the resident to know how to respond. After all, a faulty appliance giving off CO will need a very different reaction to a fire caused by an unsupervised lit candle or an electrical fault. The CO detectors, however, could be wired on their own separate circuit, and if there's a need to provide detection for, say, a boiler and a gas fire, then they could be interconnected with each other, but not to the rest of the system. That way, if they're triggered, only the alarms on those devices would sound, allowing the occupier to take the correct relevant course of action. The other type of carbon monoxide detector mentioned in the NIC Snags and Solutions book is the carbon monoxide fire detector. These operate in a slightly different way to carbon monoxide warning detectors and will detect carbon monoxide from smouldering fires and fires in which the rate of burning is controlled by the supply of air. However, BS 5839-6 makes this point in clause 12E. Carbon monoxide fire detectors or multi-sensor detectors incorporating a carbon monoxide sensor should not be used within premises unless the detectors are incorporated within a grade A system and there is a high likelihood that the system will be subject to periodic maintenance by a competent person at periods not exceeding 12 months, or a fault warning is given to indicate the need to replace the electrochemical cell of the detector before it reaches the end of its anticipated life. As we've said, these CO detectors from BG Electrical are carbon monoxide warning detectors rather than fire detectors, and so we would never use them in place of a smoke detector. However, reassuringly, they do have an end-of-life fault warning and so are suitable for use in a domestic setting for detecting CO produced by faulty fuel-burning appliances. So, those are the different kinds of fire detection, but where should they be positioned in properties? Well, it depends on what category of alarm you're installing. Let's look at our typical three-bed, two-storey property. Starting with an LD3, which is the most basic level of protection, you'd need to protect the escape routes. And so you'd put smoke detectors and alarms in the hallway and landing so that a fire in any room leaking smoke into these spaces would trigger the alarm and help the occupiers to evacuate safely. For a class LD2 system, you'd still need the detectors in the hallway and landing as previously, but if you remember from the previous video in this series, you'd also need to provide detection to all rooms or areas that present a high fire risk to occupants. This would include the kitchen, as this is where most house fires start. But as we've already discussed, using a smoke detector in this space could lead to false alarms, and so a heat detector would be the natural choice here. We'd also need to protect the principal habitable room, most likely the lounge, as it's from here that most fatal house fires break out, and smoke detection would be the most appropriate here, as the chances of false alarms are small. In a previous video in this series, we looked at Table 1 of BS 5389, which is reproduced in the Electrician's Guide to Fire Detection and Fire Alarm Systems, published by the IET, and there's some notes to that table that help us to understand some other aspects of detector location. We find in note D, which relates to most areas where LD2 systems are required, that a smoke detector should be installed in the principal habitable room. Where more than one room might be used as the principal habitable room, a smoke detector should be installed in each of these rooms. The detector in the principal habitable room, but not the kitchen, may alternatively be a carbon monoxide fire detector, 
However, consideration needs to be given to the potential for false alarms from a smoke detector in the lounge if a kitchen opens directly into or is combined with the lounge. Useful information to bear in mind there. Finally, the class LD1 system means we'd need to provide detection to the escape routes as in both the previous examples, but the requirement changes a little here and we need to provide detection to all rooms where a fire might start. So we're pretty much looking at all the rooms, including bedrooms and other reception rooms downstairs, but not toilets, bathrooms and shower rooms. Note J of table one relates mainly to rented properties and states that detectors may normally be emitted from roof voids unless there are specific significant fire hazards such as gas boilers or electrical equipment for photovoltaic systems. It's worth noting the recommendation in the practical guide to grade D fire alarm systems that if a smoke is required in a loft, it should be an ionizing smoke or multi-sensor detector with drift compensation. Note N, which relates to individual dwelling units within the HMO comprising a single room which include cooking facilities, so bedsits, specifically in HMOs which are not one or two storeys with no floor greater than 200 metres squared in area, states that in individual bedsits which include cooking facilities, a heat or multi-sensor fire alarm should be fitted. In the case of a multi-sensor fire alarm, the provision of an alarm silence facility would be beneficial. Although these types of detectors may be incorporated with the grade A system of the communal areas of the HMO and therefore out of the scope of these videos, along with the further guidance found in notes O and R, which have further information on the types of detectors to use in certain spaces. So those are the different types of detectors available and where we should use them. But where exactly should we site the detectors in the spaces once we know where they're to be installed? To find out, check out this video right here or click the link in the description below to watch it as part of our free training package to help you with your CPD and receive a free certificate as well. All that remains in this video is to say thank you very much for watching.